Um, to introduce myself, I am Christina Ashley Williams. I am an artist, I'm an educator, and I am a techie. Um, I first started building relationships with these beautiful women on the stage when in 2016, I quit my job because the impact of Black Lives Matter was weighing so heavy on my spirit that the only thing I felt was right for me to do was to document what was going on in our society and decided to sleep in my car, shoot, create exhibitions, and start submitting my work to different spaces um, to make sure that these women's stories were not going to be forgotten and that we were able to continue a conversation. So as we see today um, in, in creating spaces like this where we're able to talk in community with one another, um, I find it to be an imperative to make sure that the stories don't end just because the news cameras have gone away, right? And hashtags are no longer trending on Twitter with their children's names, because these are still lives that have been impacted. And so I want us to dive into how uh, the, the impact is going to influence our future and like what we're doing today um, to move it forward. So I'm, do we all have mics uh, on each table? Yeah, we're good, okay. So I guess Mama Gwen, if you want to start down here and we'll work our way over, if you can introduce yourself. Hi, hello everyone. Um, I'm Gwendolyn Woods, um, Mario Woods' mom. San Francisco, I don't call it a killing, a murder. It was a pure execution as of a third world country. You could Google it, you can video the last image I'll have of him is taking 21 to the back. Um, it is apparent, was not a threat to San Francisco police, um, but they feel uh, some type of way that black, brown and poor lives don't matter um, before that and, and it's the the racism that was text and email on our tax dollars in San Francisco when I saw that and I only could take a glimpse of that video I saw everything that they emailed which stated any good day is a day a good day to kill a nigga their words not mine my dad was in um, Navy um, and so um, we were taught not to use that word because at the end of that word, somebody was lynched and that was the last thing that they ever heard with that name. Um, but this is their jargon, to lower high blood pressure, go into a black community and execute them. Sergeant Kempinski of the Bayview, I was born, I'm a native of San Francisco, Bayview, where Malia Cohen um, was our supervisor, District 10, um, it's gentrification. Sergeant Kempinski that worked and took the Bayview police station stated he took the Bayview station in order to kill niggas. Again, his words. I'm going to be adamant on you or I in any given job or employment if we use racist, sexist, homophobic jargon, fire. There's a, a zero tolerance. San Francisco police and police nationwide are protected by that um, police bill of rights. We're trying to fight that. I think they're fighting hard and I can't recall the, the statement of the SB that, that's been passed, but they're fighting that hard. We have to stand up because still, I, I know that the brother earlier stated, what do we do in a community to make it better? He's talking about you and I when we work hard and we pay our taxes, we have youth and plighted communities that have no hope. So he didn't talk on that, how we expound, how we get into that, because I hear even, you know, the surviving siblings of my baby, their brother, his two brothers still state to me, there's no hope, there's no, because a black life does not matter. I said I was gonna share this and I don't mean to, here there was a, a lady who worked on one of the coalitions here in San Francisco and she had stated that she made a, it was just a general comment that Black Lives Matter wanted to come in, what have you done? And I had to clarify that long before my baby or anything in, in San Francisco, because you didn't pay attention because it was black. Now that the bully is out of the, the gate, out of the backyard, he's messing with everyone, now you want to take 
president. So you weren't, you didn't notice when Sean Bale was being slain, or Michael Brown, or Oscar Grant, or, or Eric. You didn't notice those things because it wasn't important to you until now. The bully is out and he's out of control, and now we have to find, we have to, uni we have to unite. So we have to correct those things. We can't let that racism. Yeah, I'm sorry because it's just so much. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Gwen Carr. I am the mother of Eric Garner. Every one of you seen Eric being murdered on video. The whole wa world watched as Danny Pantaleo choked my son to death. He said, I can't breathe 11 times. 11 times he said, I can't breathe. But the disconcerned police officers, they decided to take his life anyway. Well, that July day, that in uh, 2014, was one of the most horrible, the most horrific days that I had experienced. And if not for the Lord, I don't know where I'd be. But you know, by me hanging on to his everlasting arm, he was the one who put people in my way to show me what I should do. Because when these things happen to you, you don't know what to do. You don't know where to turn. And uh, some people act like they do this alone. You don't do this alone. You have to galvanize. That's why I galvanize and I connect with my sisters, my sisters in the struggle. And there are so many of us. It's not only the ones that you see here on the stage. There are thousands and thousands of us. People never heard of them. They didn't get any media coverage. Not one line in the newspaper. But their pain is the same. So that's why we as mothers, the ones who did get coverage, the ones who did get high profile, we got to take up the fight. We have to. In embrace the other mothers. We must show that there is a real problem out here. And the only way that we can show this, we gotta gather, we gotta get together. And you know, just talking about it is not gonna do it. You got to be about it. And if everyone, if everyone would come together and do their part, we know everyone is not going to do the same thing. Everyone is not as strong as the next one, even with the mothers. We have mothers at different stages. We have some mothers that can't even get out of bed in the morning. We have mothers on medication or hospitalized. These are the ones that we have to embrace if we can. And then sometimes they have to embrace us because in the midnight hour, this is when we stare at the ceiling and we cry out, we, we wonder why our child is gone. And nobody sees that. Sometimes we don't look like what we've been through. And we've been through a lot. But this journey, this journey is not an easy one. It's not a popular one. And those who start with you may not finish with you. Because we know when the lights are on, when all the cameras comes out, everybody is there. They want to be on TV. Or they want to take their opportunity at, at capitalizing on your loss. But you find out who's with you when the lights go out. If the people are still there behind the cameras, that's what counts, if they're still doing the work. And that's why I have to stay on the battlefield. I have to keep doing the work. I have to talk to these politicians about changing laws, about the way they kill our unarmed babies, the boys, the girls. It doesn't matter. We hurt when our child is gone. There's a void there. It's just a news story to some people. To the media, it's a news story. But it's our life. So we want each and every one of you not to treat the next tragedy as just a news story. We have to do something. And we can't just sympathize. We have to empathize. I thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wanda Johnson. I'm the mother of Oscar Grant, who was killed January 1st, 2009, at the Fruitvale BART station. 
by officer at that time, Johannes Meserly. I want to say to you that in 1966, I believe the uh, Black Panthers was formed. And during that time, they had a 10 point um, thing that they were going to abide by. I believe number seven or eight is police the policing. And I'm saying that to say that still 50 years later, as the Black Panthers was policing the police, we are still today having to police the police. It is time for us to come together and unite to begin to tear down the system that is not built for people of color. And as we tear it down, and the only way to tear it down is if we come together and unite as one and forget about all our different organizations, but have our eyes focused on a goal that we can accomplish. When Oscar was killed, I had instructed Oscar to take Bart to San Francisco to watch the fireworks instead of drive because Oscar was over age and if he felt like drinking, um, I would not want him to drink and drive. I would not want him to put anyone else's life in jeopardy. And so I instructed him to take Bart and never would I have thought that those who are hired to protect and serve is the one who turned around and killed my baby. And, and I'm saying that to say that it, you could have received that same phone call. As we look around in the 21st century policing, we must understand that it said that uh, every hour, I believe it is, that a black man, or every 28 hours, a black man is killed. And it's actually less than that amount of time. And so we must understand that there is no um, name or a bullet does not have a name. So you could receive the phone call as well. And so I want to encourage you today I want to encourage you not to leave this place the same way you came in, thinking how you was thinking concerning our system. When I went to the court system, when they tra changed the trial to LA, and I went to the court system, and I sat in Judge Robert Perry's uh, courtroom, and when he said to me, if we don't get those protesters out of here, he would make this case last for five years if he had to. When he said to us, to my family, after we was able to give our remarks to the officer, when he said to us, oh, I made a mistake with the, the uh, instructions I gave to the jury. I'm gonna throw out the gun enhancement charge that the jury had already convicted the officer of when he said, I already had my decision made when I first walked into this courtroom, that said volumes to us. It's on transcript, if you need to look at the transcript. That says volumes to my family. When, when we weren't allowed, all of my family wasn't even allowed in the courtroom, that said volumes to us. What did we learn from that? We learned that the system is not designed for the people of color. But the system, the prison to pipeline from age to the second or third grade where they can tell if our child is going to go to prison or they already have a mark for prison has been set up for our children. And so we have to, again, number one, exercise our rights to get people out of office and get people in office who are going to work for us to begin to tear down the system. And we have to, again, begin to get on the jury pools because when my son, when we went to trial, there was not an African-American on the jury pool. Oftentimes, we have reasons or we don't want to be on the pool, jury pools, and we must begin to exercise those rights as we work together to tear down the system. And so I want to encourage you, as Oscar was on that platform, trying to de-escalate the situation. And people came up with all kind of reasons on television of why some of our young men should have been killed. I want to begin to tell you, don't look at the news media at face value and what you watch on television and believe. You need to research what happened yourself and then come up with a conclusion. Because when our, our children were killed, a lot of negative was said concerning our young men 
And I want to say that negative that was said was not only from people of other colors, but it was people of our color who have been taught to see what they see on television and take it as faith as face value and run with it. But I want to encourage you today to begin to, don't take it at face value, but begin to research it and know that it was my child today, but there it could be your child on tomorrow. And so again, I'm the mother of Oscar Grant, the CEO of the Oscar Grant Foundation. Thank you. Hmm. I'm Alicia Garza. I'm one of the co-creators of the Black Lives Matter Global Network. And I'll just say that, um, Wanda, your son was killed three blocks from my house. And I remember coming home on New Year's and turning on the news and learning what had happened. We had meetings in my house of organizations and people who were trying to fight for justice for your son. Um, Black Lives Matter is not just a hashtag. And it's important that you all know that Black Lives Matter was started because of experiences like what Wanda is going through. Because of people like Kenneth Harding being murdered in the Bayview several years before your son was murdered nearly a block away. There are too many mothers in this city and across the country who are going through what you all are going through. And it's not a coincidence. And so when we say Black Lives Matter, what we're trying to call attention to is police violence, yes, absolutely. But it's also all of the ways in which black families and black communities are struggling and are at the losing end of almost every single disparity you can think of whether it be access to health care, whether it be access to home ownership, whether it be access to a political system so that you can change laws and policies and actually have oversight over police. Black families are losing in every aspect of the word. And so when we say Black Lives Matter, it's not because people like to be out in the streets with protest signs and bullhorns. Nobody likes tear gas, FYI. The reason that we created this organization, this network that now has 40 chapters across four countries, is not to be the latest Instagram star. It's not to be entertainment on Twitter. It's not to gather a following on Facebook. It was literally to get people to be on social media and engaging, but also do something in real life. Do something in real life. So it's important to me that people know that because I think six years later, after Black Lives Matter was created, we still get the same, I'm sorry, but they're stupid questions at this point. Because we're not taking seriously the conditions that black families are facing. And yes, there is um, progress that is being made, but I will tell you, as long as families like the Johnsons or the cars or the woodses are losing their children. As long as there's empty seats at people's tables during holidays and birthdays and weddings and anniversaries and graduations, at the hands of the people that you pay to protect you, we have a problem. So I live in Oakland and in our city, 40% of our general fund goes to policing. And a huge majority of that is settlements to families like Wanda's. Wrongful death suits. We pay out millions and millions of dollars that could be going to schools and striking teachers like what's also happening in Oakland today for police who kill and then are not held accountable. You should know that in the case of Oscar Grant, Johannes Mejerly was the first officer in the history of California to be held accountable for the crime that he committed. The first one. It's not 1954, y'all. This was in 2009. The first officer, do you think that was the first murder? So, 
Yes, I think it's important that you brought up things like the police officer's bill of rights, which people don't know, actually keeps police from being held accountable. We need oversight bodies that actually have teeth in decision making. But we also need to make sure that other things in our communities are being resourced at higher levels than policing is. Because at the end of the day, you could put a million more police in communities and it's not going to solve crime. It's not. The reason that we have these kinds of dynamics happening in our communities is because we don't have the resources that we need to live well. It's not just about mindset. I know people like to talk about that. Well, it's our mindset and if we would, no. What kind of mindset do you have when you're in a school with no books? What kind of mindset do you have when somebody gets shot and you can't call the police because they don't come? What kind of mindset are you supposed to have when you can't access health care? What kind of mindset should you have when you can't get access to affordable education? These things are all connected. And until we start talking about them as such, we are going to have more mothers like these ones who are going without the things that they need, their children and their families being whole. So that's all I'll say for now. Okay, my name is um, Terry Jackson. I'm a um, Superior Court judge here in San Francisco. Last Me year- first African American. Come on. Come on. <laughs> Last year, I was the presiding judge of San Francisco, which meant all of San Francisco courts. Um, and I just want to kind of do a qualification. I'm not allowed, as I was telling my intern, Jordan, who's in the audience with me. And Jordan's doing a fantastic job from San Francisco State. Hello, Judges, we have a canons that we're restricted on what we can say. And we can't talk about politics and so forth and social issues. And as I told Jordan, when you become a judge, and the governor says this, when you get appointed, you want to be a judge, you give up your First Amendment rights. So I just want you to know that I'm not trying to hold back, but some things I cannot comment on. But I will say it is a tremendous honor to be here. It's more importantly, it's a tremendous honor to be able to share this platform and this stage with the surviving, very strong individuals. And this is my second time with Ms. Johnson and she was a great inspiration when we served on another panel. So what am I gonna tell you about our justice system? I can't tell you it's perfect by no means, stretch of the imagination, but I can give you a little background of what I went through. Yes, I've been close to 40 years in the legal profession. I started at age 12, by the way. But <laughs> when I first started as a deputy DA, I was the first woman, African-American woman in this particular um, office and it was not easy because their automatic assumption was well she is going to be easy she does not know the law she cannot even speak english and i can just give you one example of a case that i had handled and they uh, you know i had the support of the da's office but it was just no there there the officers did it wrong it was as though they had gone to every law book and they did every search and it was a great deal of um narcotics, but they did the search wrong. And I got up and dismissed the case. As a result of it, the police department retaliated against me. Then moving forward to joining San Francisco DA's office, I remember when I was assigned my first homicide case, um, the lieutenant came down to my office and said, I thought Arlo Smith, who was the DA at the time, only give the, um, the premier DA's the assignment. Why am I telling you this story? Yes, I was the first African-American woman appointed to the bench in 2002. 2002, folks, in San Francisco. And I'll never forget my appointment from Gray Davis when he called and said to me, and at that time, Shreveport, Louisiana, Shreveport, Louisiana, where my parents are from, they had already had their first African-American woman judge. She was the presiding judge, and in 2002, she was ready to retire. And San Francisco then turns around and appoints, or did not have one. So when Gray Davis called and told me that I got the appointment, I'll, I'll never forget his words. He said, is Shreveport, Louisiana, 
going to have a black woman as their judge, then it's about time San Francisco has one. What do I bring to the table as a judge? Am I going to be any different? No, I'm going to apply the law. But we do bring our background. I grew up, I was born and raised here in San Francisco. I can talk about Paradise Missionary Baptist Church on San Jose Avenue. I can tell you some of the places like the Monte Carlo Club where they had very good gumbo, by the way, <laughs> in the Bayview. So I was born and raised here, but I bring that perspective of what it is to be out in San Francisco and on the streets where the, when crimes were happening against African Americans, they did not take those cases seriously, particularly if it was black on black. Those cases didn't even see the light of day. And I do remember when I became, um, as a DA in San Francisco, that they used to put little labels on cases to let it be known. It was a police code, but we figured it out. If it was black on black, or allegedly uh, black on um, an African American assaulting a Caucasian person. And, we, and I was very proud to say I broke that code and stopped it. If there was a crime, you bring it to me and we charge it. If there is no crime, then it doesn't get charged, but you do not charge a person because of their race or their sexual orientation. <laughs> My goal, and I wanna talk a little bit about our courts, and Ms. Johnson, I am so glad you said, we need more people in our courtrooms. When I go out in that courtroom, I may see one or two African Americans as jurors. We should have jurors of our peer. We have a diverse community, but why is that? that we are not getting people of color. And most of the time is that they work or we work for employers who do not pay for jury service. So as when I was a presiding judge, that was one of my goals, to go around to every business and say, you know, you get sued from time to time and you come into our courtroom. So if you can come into our courtroom and use the resources of the courts, then why shouldn't your employees have the benefit of coming in and being a part of our justice system? And we now compose a list of all those employers in the city and county of San Francisco, and for that matter, the Bay Area, because a lot of people, they may live here, but li work somewhere else. <coughs> who pays and who does not pay? And we try to reach out to them to get them to pay because that's where we get more African Americans in here. It's not that we don't want to serve, it's that we cannot afford to serve. And we need to do something about that. As presiding judge, my goal was to make sure my bench is the most diverse bench. Not that I am the governor, but when you have a presiding judge, it is the governor who calls and tries to give um, get your insight on who should get appointed. I am pleased to say, not because of me only, but many of us who advocated, many people who are in this room, San Francisco now is comprised of 9% African American. We, that's not a lot, but out of 52, that's 9%. It was better when I started when there was just three of us. It is now comprised of 40% women, 18% um, gay and lesbian, 20% Asian. So we have a very diverse bench. And why is that necessary? Because our bench should reflect our community. And we should do better. And that is one of the goals. One of the things that our bench has been very, um, uh, maybe many of you don't know this. When we talk about social issues, does it impact us? We can't acknowledge, we can't say it does. But right now, did you know that the highest judge in this state, our Chief Justice of the California Supreme Court, is a woman and she's a woman of color. Very few, few people know this. And it's because of you, it's because of our community that that is possible. That same Chief Justice was the one who called and had a press conference and called out um, the then Attorney General Jeff Sessions to say, in order to have justice so people can come through our doors, I should not be coming through our courthouses. She was the first of all justices in, this, in the United States to say, I should not make arrests in our courthouse. People should be, have the ability to come and go, deal with their grievances. If they have a case that they're charged with, be able to be heard because they have the right to be heard. There's a presumption of innocence. But if ICE is waiting at the door, they won't come to court. Also, what I'm very proud of recently is bail reform, which impacts 
our community. I was one of 11 or 10 judges who helped write the um, report that was the basis for the legislation to get rid of bail in the state of California. Bail is discrimination. Bail because we are poor, we can't get out. We should be based on, um, release should be based upon the case, how serious the case is, and whether or not you're a public safety and you're a flight risk, not because of who can pay that bail. So I'm very proud of some of the things that I've been able to do personally as a judge, and I wouldn't be here but for the sacrifices of all of you on this stage. And I'm sorry you're on this stage, but you're very important. And I'm glad you said that when the cameras are off, that struggle still goes. And that's what's important here, not just as a judge. And I'm the first to say it's not a perfect system, but the more we are able to have access and to participate, the more that we as judges reach out in the community to learn, to hear, that it will be a better system. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. You can have that one thank you all. So these next set of questions are going to be to um, particular representatives on this stage. Um, and we'll go through, if anyone feels particularly compelled to also add in to those questions, by all means, um, jump in. Um, in my years of knowing you, I have heard and seen different um, representations of what the experience is like for you all. Um, Mama Gwen, as has been um, stated here, the sentiment around the disappearance of the narrative, right, and the invisibilization of the experience. Um, can you share a particular um, sentiment or reality for you that the general public may not realize is your truth? I guess because I think when this happens to us, uh, we become um, the system. They demonize us mm -hmm. and our children. I say with Mar, he wasn't the perfect child by no means, but we had every right to make it through our struggles. Came back via Houston, where we live, we brought the home in Houston, because my mom had terminal cancer. A lot of that I blame, and I had to take care of her. Um, their dad um, ended up uh, abandoning the family, sold the house on us. So I had this kid, young, and all these losses, buried my sister. Six months later, buried my brother on a, in, in that plan. So there was a lot with three sons I had to pull together. But our struggle was our struggle, and it was our truth. Mm -hmm. So my fight is that they gave you his youth years. I always had the same for Mark. I pray you through those proverb years. Somebody asked me to do an interview, what does that mean? Those knucklehead years. Mm -hmm. When you keep running against that brick wall, we had to own our truth because the city held me against that. Everything I did or said when we went to a death position, they held my life against me. Uh, but I stood for my life. I worked every day. I brought the home in Houston. I yeah, told my mom when we left Bayview, I'm never coming back. I worked lawn comb, district manager. We did our due. His dad was Air Force. Worked, But when we came back, it's where it fell apart. My mom, terminal. So I had these three sons I had to take care of on, on my salary by Air California here in San Francisco and then had to take care of her and bury her and still worked. I still had to get up. I took a managed job at Saks Fifth Avenue and still had to work. And I saw them. And Mario, I, Michael, my middle, was the introvert. Monroe was the, that militant one, the conspiracy theorist we call him. That Mar, though, that Mar man, he was my truth. He was that guy, remember we had the conversation, and he did a long bid. So if you read it, Google, it's there. He did Folsom transition from 16 to 25. Every weekend I spent at Folsom Prison. It's the catch. I have found myself having to work in this system because I had to find pieces, how I get solace with this. 
our conversations there, he gave me the synopsis of, Mom, what do you think of the Stalin theory? This was this kid, this beautiful kid. But you read what they said in the newspaper about him. He, they called us a thug. And I said, if we're a thug, then I'll own that. Because like you said, when it came down to Kenneth Hardy, who San Francisco slain and wouldn't let us give that baby any CPR in the Bayview, my community, they let him bleed out. They let that officer transfer out of San Francisco to Santa Rosa or Marin, that, and he end up going to molest boys. And I know I'm going on this rant because I'm going to give you my truth. If you take Tamar Rice, and they finally fired that officer for lying on his application, if you just look deeper and found that he lied in the beginning, that baby still possibly would still be here. But they hold our black sons against all their, they can't be redeemed. White boys can rape and pillage in broad daylight, and the judge will say, you get six months, but you're gonna do you three. You have affluenza. Because I do not want to ruin your life. You take a white boy and he can walk into a Bible study and annihilate. And he gets the courtesy of a Burger King burger and a bulletproof vest. Tell me if there's not the two types of policing. This kid was my truth. What you never know is that he could tie a tie because me and his dad, we taught him that. This is stuff you won't know about our babies because they don't ask. They consider we raise these, these thugs, so we're thugs. I've had to stand on everything our life was about to the city, and I still have to go in, and I had to perform. We have to go, and we have to defend ourselves in our life. When we did, we lost everything. Everything, we have to sit down, and we have to explain why our children didn't deserve to be slain and executed. This is what the city does. This is what cities do nationwide. This kid said to me one time, and it made me rethink everything about what I believed and known and trust, especially this particular incident. And he said, Mom, you're just, he would get up, and I had them put their suits on, got to go to church. And he was like, you're this legalistic Christian. And I said, what do you know about that, kid? What do you know about that? He said, that person that just likes to look a certain way. What's the standard supposed to be? What is the status quo? We came down to this disagreement of every first Sunday you wear a suit, then you and Michael can go in and you can wear your jeans, no a baggy, because that's the way I raised them. I did believe as a parent consequences of your behavior, but I said it won't stop me from loving you any less. I thought I would visit you in college, but we found ourselves in Folsom. So guess what? Eight years, eight years I waited for this kid to come home. Eight years, every conversation, and this odd, crazy part of me had to go back, which means God placed me there to say, here's where the fight's going to begin. You know how many votes are going to come out of prison now because these, 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 these inmates getting out to vote? We need that. So my truth now is just it's owning my life. Not the pretentiousness of it. Not what you expect me to be or anyone. It's guess what? I'm his last voice to the end. You didn't know him. You will know him. I don't even have time to grieve. You know what that's like. You got to fight. We can't even bury them. We can't even grieve. You have to fight. You have to get up and fight. And how dare us as black mothers if sometimes we have to work two jobs. Right. That's the truth. It sways back and forth. I haven't, I haven't found a solace yet. Because I, there's one point I had to go under the radar. Because the people that want whatever the issues are, they want that limelight, they want that, what, that 15 minutes to be by your side, whatever you think the money's going to be. We're still in this conversation. I'm with you, Judge. It becomes, guess what? I can't even tell you the half of the story. Because you know once they say they're going to pay off and say, guess what? That's now... I feel like I'm selling my child out completely, completely. The city, now I'm going back into a, 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 another talk, but I have to be careful because when they took me in the first deposition, that was seven hours long. The truth, I don't know yet. 
it, it changed my religion, it changed my belief, it changed my faith. For the good, yeah, I'm willing to hear other people's stories and their side of it, how they look at it. But right now I'm so conflicted with the city of San Francisco, a city I was born and raised in. My dad was naval, he brought his first home. I remember when Sunnydale was owned by the Navy and it was, had a milkman, it had grass, it had a gardener. I remember out of college, out of high school, I got my first job at PG&E, which was straight across the street from Hyatt. So now I'm so conflicted, it's a different world to me. It's like I, I don't remember growing up here, but being back here, it messes with you. It changes every dynamic of what you knew to believe and trust in. The whole thing changes. You have to find some way. Alicia, I'm gonna have the same question um, go to you, particularly because I remember when we were shooting, an intimate moment happened there um, where emotion was evoked in you because you had a space to kind of like pause and really reflect on like the toll of like everything um, weighing on your shoulders and the expectations that people have of you as being this now leader, right? So I'd love for you to share, um, again, the question was, what is something that the general public may not realize about your experience in the movement? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, before I answer that, um, you know, I have to be honest that um, sitting here with the three of you makes me think about a thing my mom said to me growing up, which was um, that it was my job to bury her. And that that was the point of why she was always on me. 100%, because she didn't want to bury me. And so if we're not understanding that in a deep way, what it does to families that have to bury their children before they should, but then also to have to fight a city to be able to bury their children with the dignity that the city stole from them then we don't understand what's actually happening. You know, it's interesting because when we started Black Lives Matter, the point was not to be in the spotlight. And I've been an organizer in the Bay Area for 20 years. Worked in Bayview for 10 years. That's how I know about Kenneth Harding. Fighting PG&E and Lennar and all these corporations. You talked about gentrification and my family is fourth generation San Francisco and I don't recognize the city. Black Lives Matter wasn't started for limelight. It was to bring awareness to the things that we see that never make the news. Being in public housing in Oakdale with folks that we were organizing and watching the gang task force run through the development once a week, wearing different color camouflage outfits, laughing as they are trashing people's homes. People's homes. It has an impact on you. And so the point and when I say that Black Lives Matter was influenced and informed by those experiences, that's what I mean. A year after we started Black Lives Matter, nobody knew who we were. And we did that on purpose. And the only time that we actually stepped up to say this is something we created is because people were trying to manipulate what it was. There were a lot of um, organizations, I would say, trying to find relevance mm -hmm. and knowing that young people were gravitating towards Black Lives Matter, and so they were claiming it, saying, we started that. But yet, taking the message 
and making it in such a way where it was blaming us for things we didn't create. And these were black organizations, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So um, the narrative of being thugs and um, mothers who couldn't take care of their children. I mean, when I was watching the Trayvon Ma Martin case and I was watching the trial for George Zimmerman, I watched what they did to Sabrina. And it was that thing that really like bothered me in a deep way. Because my mom worked three jobs to take care of me. She had her twin brother with her to help her. So I wasn't by myself. But if she didn't have that support and something happened to me, they would have been saying the same story. Oh, you just can't take care of your kids. Why didn't you take care of him better? Why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? That is a part of this dynamic. So what people don't understand then about putting a thing into the world that um, becomes something that people know about is that um, it's not fun. It's not fun, it's not sexy. Everybody wants something from you. Mm -hmm. And you can't meet all of the things that people want from you. And you want to because you want to. Like I want to meet everything that you need. And I don't want you to be awake at midnight staring at the ceiling by yourself. But we can't do that on our own, right? And so I think the thing that I was sharing with Christina is that you get a lot of people who engage you the way that we engage everything else in our lives, which is as entertainment. And I'm constantly telling people, this isn't the Wendy Williams show, right? This isn't, this isn't meant to be the latest gossip rag about who likes who and who rolls with who. And, and then there were the stories about you know, how much we get paid. So if, if you believed everything you read about Black Lives Matter, you would think I had a helicopter pad <laughs> and red bottom shoes and all the things. I don't. Up until six months ago, I lived in East Oakland in the same apartment that I've been in for 14 years. And I now live in Latifah's old house. And only because Latifah was like, girl, I'm moving. You need to get in here. That's called a hookup. <laughs> right? So um, I just say all that to say, I'm somebody who believes that um, leadership shouldn't be lonely, mm -hmm. but I think we have a thing that we do with leaders where we treat people like um, yeah. folks that we watch on TV, not like people that have an agenda that we want to support and that we want to get behind and that we want to make sure becomes successful. So yeah, And so I, I would imagine that it's the same with you all too that people attach themselves to you and they want to be seen as down and the revolutionaries and all this, but at the end of the day, nothing's changing because they're more concerned about how they're being seen than whether or not they're being effective. So, so um, I will say that what you should know, um, as I said earlier, is that Black Lives Matter is not just a hashtag that it is our blood, sweat, and tears, literally. You should know that Patrice and Opal and I created Black Lives Matter for us to have a vehicle to challenge the um, disparities in our systems and to create new systems that work for everybody. You should know that um, we are organizers. I didn't come into this in 2013. I wasn't, I didn't wake up in 2013 and be like, hey, we should do something about this. Let's start a movement. Let's start a movement. <laughs> and we didn't start a movement. Right. What we did was we created an organization and we created space for people to be a part of something. And then that took off. Mm -hmm. And it took off because there were more murders. Right. It took off because Trayvon was not the only person who was assassinated, but then it was Eric Garner, and then it was Michael Brown, mm -hmm. and before that it was Mario Woods, and before that it was Oscar Grant, and before that it was Kenneth Harding. Like, it didn't stop. 
and then there was Renisha McBride, and then there was Sandra Bland, right? It didn't stop. And so once people started to see there's a pattern, even though it had been happening for a while, we were lucky and were able to break through a veil. And a lot of it had to do with the fact that, to be honest, um, after a year of building Black Lives Matter, when Michael Brown was killed, we did a freedom ride to Ferguson and brought black media. Mm. That's what happened. Mm. So CNN was on the ground in St. Louis filming tear gas and riots. And that only changed when black media went to St. Louis. That was our contribution. We were able to change the narrative. Yeah. We started telling our own stories in our own environments. And then CNN started to say, oh, we need to listen to what they're talking about because they're actually there and on the ground and in relationship and getting into places we can't get into. Remember when Don Lemon wasn't our favorite? Don Lemon got woke because of us, right? He wasn't on our side before. If you don't, don't forget now, this was not that long ago. We, we took him back, but it took some work. So let me just say one last thing and then I'll close. Um, we don't do this for limelight. And in fact, I will tell you, hand to God, that if none of you ever knew who I was, I'm fine with that. And you'd still be doing the work. I'm fine with that. I will still be doing this work. I did want to say this, too, in commending of Black Lives Matter, because we knew when Kaepernick did take the knee, very, very proud of the moment. But unfortunately, it kind of distracted from our babies. It did. Now it's he's the man in charge. He's a, it doesn't focus now on the black lives that really have been annihilated where Black Lives Matter, you guys stay focused on what the cause was, why did the cause start, and why it should continue. I commend that, because our babies, after, again, I took um, much, much proud of Kaepernick for not standing, and, but unfortunately, it's now kind of washed out our babies, and really what the stance was for, because now it's now, the, the, the moment of what is important now, man of the year. And I believe he deserves all his accolades, I really do. But unfortunately, the message is lost, I believe. Some of that has I to do with the media. Yeah. And A I, lot I, of it has to do with the media. I, I think that our society, as when our, when our boys was killed or murdered, um, that for a while, a lot of people join together and protest and do all kind of things. And then afterwards, it fuzzles out. Yeah. And what we have to do, and I found this to be true for my family, is to continue to keep your child's name in the forefront. And every opportunity that you get to share that name. And I was given a story or a prophetic word at church one time, and it was Wanda go read about Rispa. And she was a woman in the Bible who had two sons and they were both hung and she would not just let her son stay there. She began to protect her sons as they was being hung from every attack of the animals that would try to come and get near her sons. And she did that for so long, it said for a whole harvest season, for about six months it said she did that. And finally, David, who's in the Bible, King David, heard what she was doing and granted permission for her sons to be taken down and given them a burial. And I'm saying all this to say is that we cannot forget. We have to remember that even as the Black Panthers in 66 and 
I think his name was Danzel, who was killed in Richmond, and they went and they stood on corners, and they wanted to find out what really happened to him, why he was killed. That same scenario, well, they had received a phone call that there was a robbery, and he looked like the suspect, and he was running away from the liquor store, they said, and so they ended up shooting and killing him. That same story, 50 years ago, we're still right here today with those same stories. It looked like he had a gun. He was resisting arrest. He, he, he was reaching for his waistband. I, I, I thought he was going to shoot me. Those same scenarios we hear day after day when our young men are being killed. And yet, we still don't make the noise and lasting noise to get the system changed, to get it to where police are held accountable for their actions. In, in, in my son's case, the officer ended up getting 11 months in county jail. I, I, I wanna make sure we understand, not prison, county jail, where he was given an irre ir irrevocable, um, where he is able to carry a gun again, not have to, not, he did not have to report to a, uh, uh, a officer, uh, um, that is not a probation officer, uh, um, that he did not have to report to an officer each month, but he was able to go on back to his daily lives. Now, if it had been your child who was caught with drugs, he would have a prison sentence, okay? or even like Michael Vick would have four years in jail. But this officer only had 11 months. And oftentimes we ask people, black people, are more harder on ourselves than the Caucasian people. We're worse, we're our own worst enemy oftentimes because we believe and we say, oh, well, he got what he deserved. He, he had been to jail already. So, oh, he didn't graduate from high school. So, oh, oh, he was on the corner selling cigarettes. So that's what he deserved. He was breaking the law. That's what we often say. We may be afraid to admit that, but uh, really, we have to really go back and examine ourselves and our beliefs and what we're pouring into our communities of people to make sure that they don't have to go through that. And so for this year, the Oscar Grant Foundation has vowed that we will work with PTSD because our children are being suspended from schools, they're being kicked out of class, and they are going to, they are being sent to jail. And why? Because we never know what they have seen. We don't realize that they may have seen their friend get shot and killed. We don't realize that they may have seen their mother at home getting beat up by the boyfriend or the father. We don't realize what they've seen, and we don't realize that the reason why they're acting the way that they're acting is because maybe they are suffering from PTSD. And so it's our job, it is our job to really begin to pour into our young men and women's lives because we realize that our sons are not here any longer and there's nothing that we could do to bring them back. But because we have voices, we will work to instill a change in our society by working with our young men and our young women and trying to educate ourselves and others on the reality of this that if they could look at a child in the third grade and make a decision if, there's, if they're going to prison or not, that's a problem for our people. Instead of them building the prisons, we should be building institutions, colleges, so that our children can go from second grade on to high school, on to college, and be the successful people that they created us to be. But oftentimes, we look at it and when our child makes a mistake, forgetting the mistakes that we have made, right? We, we don't do anything wrong no more because we are adults, but we try to forget those things. And so because we try to forget those things, when 
our young men or young women are making mistakes or doing things that are not what we call what they're supposed to be doing or getting in trouble with the system. We want to throw the towel in and we want to throw them away instead of remembering that love covers a multitude of sins. And so had not been for the love of God for my own life, who knows where I'll be? You know, when my son was killed, had not been for God, I could be in John George, but God. And so because of that, his mercy, we too ought to have mercy on others. And just before I close, I was just reading this morning in Matthew chapter 18, it was talking about a judge who he, someone owed some money to the judge. And, and the man went to the judge and said to forgive him that he didn't have it. Would you please forgive me of my debt? And he did that. And so I'm saying that to say that even when we have had mercy given unto us, when others at times want to come to us, even our own kids want to come to us and need our help, we shut the door. But I'm asking each one of you today to look into your hearts and pull somebody alongside of you and have mercy on them to help them to become the people that you yourself are today. Mm. Establish well uh, elected officials and fearfully and wonderfully made people, educated people. Have mercy mm. for somebody else. Mm. Help them to be able to help somebody else. That's beautiful, Mama Wanda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mama Carr, I would love to hear one of your proudest moments coming out of the movement. I know a lot of times we we know really heavily like the traumas, right, and the um, the impact that can be often like negative in the experiences. Um, but I'd love for you to share, um, and if another volunteer would like to also share, and then we'll have one more question for um, Judge Jackson, and we'll close. Um, what is one of the proudest movements, moments coming out of the movement, um, an impact that like, the community may have had on you personally? Uh, well, um, one of my proudest moments was when my son, it had been maybe uh, six months after my son was murdered. And I was coming from a, a, one of the TV shows, you know, because everybody wants, you know, you to be on TV, they want you to come and make a statement. And I was in Manhattan, and I was in the car coming back home. And as we're coming down the West Side Highway, which is one of the, the busiest highways in New York, the, the car stopped. He says, oh, well, he says, we're being stopped here. And you know, all the cars in front of us were stopped. And when we looked, it was all of these people coming up the highway, stopping traffic, calling my son's name. They had blocked the whole highway off. And so the drivers were saying, oh, wow, we're never going to get out of here. And I told them it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> we can stay here till tomorrow morning, you know, because they are chanting my son's name. They, that means that this awareness has taken effect. And it was not only black people, it was everybody. All, all nations, there was even a few uh, rabbis. So I just was so, so proud that everybody, every nation, every creed of people was coming up that highway and stopping traffic. And I said to them, I didn't, uh, my sister was with me and she said, so I opened the window. So she says, well, if they see you, we never gonna get out of here. <laughs> so, <laughs> But I did, I let them, I didn't say who I was, I just opened the window and it was a white guy who looked in the window and he said, 
this is Eris Gardner's mother over here. He recognized who I was, and I never did say anything. And he came over there just to shake my hand. They all came past very orderly. And, you know, some wanted to take pictures. Some wanted to just shake my hand and uh, or give a word of encouragement. And I think that was a very, very encouraging moment for me. And just like we were talking about Kaep uh, Kaepernick, he didn't personally know any of our sons, but he was willing to take a knee for them. And me and the mothers in New York, we did the same thing. We supported him. And I was advised against this. Um, you don't know who may be watching. You are a public figure. I says, I'm going to do whatever I think is right. It doesn't matter to me what people think, because if he took a knee for our children, I'll take a knee for him. And, I, and so one reporter asked me, why was I taking a knee? Or why did I think Kaepernick was taking a knee? I said, because America has brought us to our knees. Mm -hmm. That's why we are down here. And we want to make aware of all these negative situations, all these killings that's taking place and nobody is doing anything about it. Just like myself and other New York mothers, we went to Governor Cuomo, because uh, he's our governor in New York. And we go to Albany in the snow, the sleet, whatever it is, because we wanted him to do something for us, to save other people's children. Like Wanda was saying, it's too late for our children, but we don't want another mother joining this club. So we went and asked him for an executive order for a special prosecutor. And what that does is when the senseless killing takes place of our unarmed children, it takes it out of the hands of the local DA and puts it in the hands of the state attorney general. And what this does is give us a more fairer playing ground uh, when it comes to having a trial or a police officer who has wrongly killed our children being convicted or standing accountable. And it's not law yet in New York, but um, we are struggling to make it a law. So we, we did that and he did sign it. And that was another great moment for us that we went there and first he wouldn't even meet with us. We brought makeshift coffins and set them in front of his door. And we asked him, what are you gonna do with these bodies? Mm -hmm. What are you going to do about them? Mm -hmm. And he seemed we were serious. And he had a conference with us and told us at the end of session, if his bill wasn't passed, which it was a watered down bill, and we wouldn't want that to pass anyway, that <laughs> he would um, sign our executive order, and which he did, but we made him change a lot of things. He thought he was just going to push it over on us. We brought a lawyer to to the signing with us, a lady lawyer, and <laughs> she told us that she wanted to look at it overnight, and we were on the phone all night with Governor Cuomo changing the little loopholes in it, and we got, he wanted it to last just a year, we got that thrown out, it's lasting until it becomes law. So. I, I thank each and every one of you, and we hope that all of you would give us your support. We go around the nation speaking, and it's not an easy task. We don't get rich off of this. A lot of times we do this, we're not getting paid at all. But we know that the message has to get out here, and our children's name have to be uplifted. Because if we don't do it, no one else is going to do it. It'll be swept under the rug like so many other cases before. And we are not willing to let that happen. And I talk all about this. Maybe some of you don't know that I have a book out that calls This Stops Today. And what that book talks about is my struggle um, my, uh, about me growing up, about what I did before my son was murdered, what I, what I did while he was being murdered, and what I'm doing now. 
And it's, the book is actually a call to action. It tells everyone, we must not let this knock on our door before we do something about it. And after the uh -huh. panel today, um, there will be a table set up in the career fair area if you would like to come and speak with Ms. Carr about um, her book. There will be some um, available for everyone. I want to thank everyone um, for being here. Mm -hmm. uh, we are running out of time, unfortunately. It's a very deep conversation, one that can continue. <laughs> I think we've actually done a panel it's like three hours <laughs> before a couple yeah. of us. Um, but I do want uh, to give respect to Judge Jackson. <laughs> um, thank you so much for, for being here, for showing up. She left court <laughs> to come over here this morning. Sorry, I do have to get she's, back to she's court. She's getting back to I court have, right um, now. Some people waiting for me. Yeah, so absolutely. I appreciate being here again. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And one thing I do want to say, there's no such thing as a thug. Mm -hmm. They're human beings. Mm -hmm. And in my courtroom, I can't, there are 1,600 judges in the state of California, trial judges. And what we can do is, in, uh, what I can do in my courtroom, when they address people, they address them with respect and dignity. There are no thugs. They're human beings, they have a right to be heard. Mm -hmm. And you know, as my grandmother says, your reputation go places where your body will never go. Mm -hmm. And I have a feeling because of what I've done in the 17 years, other judges are starting to treat people as human beings and understand this. So thank you. Uh -huh. thank you. Thank you.